things. Today we will be talking about Hughes Stone Syndrome. So what is Hughes Stone Syndrome? Hughes Stone Syndrome is a rare condition characterized by two entities namely pulmonary artery aneurysms and peripheral venous thrombosis. So we have two images here. The first image shows peripheral venous thrombosis or deep vein thrombosis DVT in the left leg of an individual and this image shown below shows the gross specimen of a lung in a patient who has multiple pulmonary aneurysms and thrombosis. In this histopathological image derived from this specimen we see a thrombus attached to the wall of the blood vessel and it appears to be adherent. So these are the two components of hughes stone syndrome. So uh, these two components were described together uh, a long time ago uh, by the beginning of a nine, uh, by the beginning of the 20th century. However, the, uh, this was named as hughes stone syndrome later around 1959 or 1964 around this time. It is named after two British scientists, Dr. J. P. Stowin, J. P. Hughes and P. G. Stowin. So now that we know about this, what else do we need to know? There is also a major controversy as to whether this is really a syndrome by itself, a novel syndrome by itself, or it's merely a manifestation of another disease. Which other disease are we talking about? You are talking about the other disease which presents with similar manifestations, which is Bechet's disease. So some people believe this is a cardiovascular variant of Bechet's disease. So it is also known as incomplete Bechet's or a rare manifestation of Bechet's in different uh, articles in the internet. So we'll go to the epidemiology. So as for, uh, first we will be talking about gender. This condition mainly involves males. It is more common in males, which is very much unlike the other autoimmune conditions or what we consider as autoimmune conditions rather should we say. The next thing is age. It's usually seen in the second to third decades from around 15 to 50 years of age. And the third thing is race, ethnicity or the place where it occurs. Now why I haven't included it in the slide because there is not much difference. It has been reported in many places but there is no specific predilection for a certain place. We have seen this case in Europe, we have seen it in Africa, we have seen it in Asia and so on. So this is the epidemiology of this condition. So let's go next to the etiopathogenesis of this condition. So the etiology of the condition is not exactly known. There are many postulated theories. One theory is that this is an uh, infective condition. They, this theory believes, this theory suggests rather that these pulmonary aneurysms are due to an infection certain elsewhere in the body which leads to uh, aneurysm formation due to infective inflammation and so on. Similar to the mycotic aneurysm seen in infective endocarditis. So this is one theory. Now we know that there are uh, many infective etiologies associated with autoimmune conditions. For example, you have porphyromonas gingivalis association with rheumatoid arthritis. We have association of a large number of organisms like hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, hepatitis E. We have parovirus B19. We have uh, uh, streptococcus salivaris, streptococcus sanguis, streptococcus mitis. We have uh, saccharomyces cerevisiae. All these organisms are associated with patients. We do not have a clear etiological rule or causative rule, but we are all supposed to be related to Bechet's disease. Similarly, in many cases of Hughes-Toman syndrome, and by many I am talking relatively because not too many cases of Bechet's have, of, uh, I'm sorry, Hughes-Toman syndrome have been described in literature so far. So, uh, in many of these cases, there have been uh, uh, the pre preceding infection before the uh, manifestations of disease shown up, such as oophoritis, uh, scrotal abscess, epidemitis, and so on. So another theory is that, of course, as I told you earlier, this is simply a cardiovascular manifestation of pressure. So we might have to think about the HLA grouping. HLA B51 is usually supposed to be in close uh, relationship with Bechet's disease and we also have a large number of uh, other theories trying to explain this condition. So the uh, in original theory, what uh, Hughes and Stowen suggested for the pathogenesis of the clinical manifestations in this condition are Degenerative bronchial arteries due to, due to angiodysplasia, which leads to changes in the vasa vessorum, which supply the pulmonary artery. This leads to inadequate nutrition of the pulmonary artery, weakening of the vessel wall, and thereby formation of pulmonary artery aneurysms. 
So now that we have described pulmonary atresia, how do you describe thrombophilia? I, I should I say I'm sorry, I shouldn't say thrombophilia. I should be saying deep vein thrombosis associated with this condition. So the exact cause again is not known. Uh, we usually can, the observations seen in this condition are that there is a increased a increase in a large number of molecules like BGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, and uh, uh, there is impaired fibrinogenolysis and so on and again along with this one should remember that hyperhomocystinemia is associated with this condition and has an independent risk of going in for thrombosis all throughout the body and next thing is uh, the clinical features of this condition so this condition usually presents with recurrent fever chills cough dyspnea chest pain and very very important is hemoptysis so these are the common clinical features and of course the clinical features of pulmonary artery hypertension are going to be there. So uh, as far as hemoptysis goes, what is the cause of hemoptysis? Uh, the, what is the importance of hemoptysis in this condition is one of the things is many a time it can be the presenting complaint because the patient might not have uh, given great importance to recurrent fever, the chills or the cough, long standing cough and all. They might have not given enough or sufficient uh, importance to this. But as soon as the patient sees blood in his cough, the cough expectorate, he is going to give it significant importance. He is going to give it uh, abundant significance. So hemoptysis is a very important thing because it can be a presenting complaint. Also, it is an important uh, part uh, of this condition which decides on the outcome because natural cause of this disease is, is usually fatal and the most common cause of fatality in this condition is usually massive hemoptysis. So now that we have established these two things, now we will go to the what is the cause of hemoptysis in this condition. There are two causes. One is the pulmonary artery aneurysm can go in for rupture leading to massive hemoptysis. Now one, I have said that pulmonary artery aneurysm is the common cause of uh, uh, hemoptysis. There is also another cause that is there can be occlusion of the pulmonary artery which can lead to uh, increased flow in and uh, hypertrophic changes in the bronchial artery which can lead to bleed from the bronchial circulation which is systemic circulation. Now as soon as I mention this I will also mention this. The other thing is that arteries or aneurysms are not isolated to the pulmonary artery. They can be they can also be involved in any other part of systemic circulation, particularly bronchial arteries can also be involved. So that is another cause of massive hemoptysis. So let's go to the next slide. So now we're going to see about the investigations, the investigations in this condition. So what are the, uh, the routine investigations are often non-specific. We're going to see anemia, we're going to see leukocytosis, we're going to see a raised CRP, raised ESR levels, and these, these are just non-specific conditions. So well, now when we take an X-ray, when you take an X-ray in such a person, we may actually see the pulmonary artery aneurysm. In this X-ray, we are able to see the pulmonary artery aneurysm uh, in this image shown here. So another thing that is done can be done is BQ scanning because there is occlusion of the pulmonary arteries, uh, and because of this, there can be a mismatch in ventilation perfusion on ventilation perfusion scanning BQ scanning. Next thing is bronchoscopy. Bronchoscopy is done in many individuals who come with hemoptysis and it may actually show dilated tonsural vessels. It may also show the aneurysms which can present as pulsatile tumors or submucosal lesions which can actually obstruct the bronchus, bronchial, bronchial lumen. So these are the findings of these investigations. So next we will go to the other imaging findings. We, we can do conventional angiography and it is believed to be the gold standard for this condition. However, the problem is when a patient has deep vein thrombosis, we may, not, we may not be able to pass the catheter so as to get sufficient imaging of these vasculature. Another problem is when we are doing this conventional angiography, we may actually lead to inadvertent rupture of the pulmonary artery aneurysms, leading to further deterioration of the patient's condition due to hemoptysis and so on. So another thing that can be done is contrast enhanced MRA, which is magnetic resonance angiography which can be done however magnetic ang resonance angiography has uh, less uh, validity in picking up smaller aneurysms so what is better is contrast enhanced mdcta which is multi detector uh, row helical cta which is computed tomography angiography so this is uh, a very good investigation because there is lot more uh, chance of picking up smaller pulmonary aneurysms pulmonary artery aneurysms so these can be done and uh, here actually we are able to see the aneurysm as a lobular mass. So this is an, uh, just an imaging, uh, just an image shown here. And finally histology, many a time when the patient dies of this condition, uh, there may be a pathological autopsy done which may show the characteristic typical findings of Hickstobin syndrome which are 
One, it shows perivascular infiltrates by lymphomonocytic cells, which usually occurs around the capillaries and venules, and there may also be diffuse sclerosis. So these are uh, characteristic findings on histopathology, which may be able to appreciate. So what is the treatment? Uh, when we become a patient, we need to pick up the patient very early because they may progress fast, they may lead to mortality, significant mortality may be there and the morbidity is again uh, an issue. So we will have to see about the treatment part. Treatment part can be medical or surgical. Medical part is usually through use of two drugs. One is the cytotoxic drugs and the immunosuppressant drugs. So cytotoxic drug is preferred drug is cyclophosphamide and cyclophosphamide can be combined with glucocorticoids and this combination can be used in these individuals and the thing is in certain individuals it's been documented that it slows the progression of aneurysms and even sometimes aneurysms have disappeared after taking this therapy so another thing is surgical surgical therapy uh, uh, when uh, only an isolated lobe is involved or uh, we can actually go in for lobectomy or pneumonectomy to control hemoptysis and so on uh, but uh, again the uh, this problem is uh, usual conventional surgical procedures is that there is uh, bilaterality and multifocality in these uh, in these individuals. That is, the aneurysms may involve uh, different parts of the lung or different parts of the different lungs of the two lungs of the individual. So this can lead to complications. So massive surgery may be did not, surgery may not be feasible. And again, surgery has significant risk in these individuals. So what is even better is the image shown here, which is transcathedral uh, uh, transcathedral. Uh, uh, interventions which are more useful in these individuals. So another point is anticoagulant use in such such individuals. The role is actually uh, very uh, controversial. Some people consider it to be an indication, some people consider it to be a contraindication because it can actually be useful in DVT and the peripheral venous thrombosis but it can be detri detrimental in a patient who is having hemoptysis, who is prone to have hemoptysis, who is about to have hemoptysis. In such individuals he may have massive hemoptysis and lead to death. So this is about hughes stowen syndrome. Uh, I'd like to thank the, uh, all the respective owners for lending their images. Thank you.